All right. Uh, next up, we have Tim Bailey. Uh, Tim Bailey is an advisor at the Watershed Research and Training Center, where he works on the intersection between forest hydrology, data science, and climate adaptation planning in Northwest California. Tim, uh, thanks. Thanks for speaking, and uh, take it away. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's um, it's an honor to be in this uh, program. Really, um, have been um, um, it's it's a it's a phenomenal lineup. Um, and also, I want to say that uh, Phosphor G has been an important uh, place to find technology, and I really appreciate the uh, global community that's contributed. Um, okay, so uh, my program um, is basically a um, focused on developing user capacity to use open source uh, tools. And rather than focusing on kind of the development environment, um, what we've been seeing as um, one of our um, problems has been um, uh, lack of um, ability to uh, apply um, these, these remarkable high quality data sets towards um, uh, you know, our natural resource challenges. So first, a um, little bit about myself. Um, so I'm work, I work for the Watershed Research and Training Center. Um, I run two programs. Uh, one of them is I'm shared stewardship advisor for uh, six national forests in, in Northern California. And so what I facilitate are um, uh, cross-boundary projects and projects funded through uh, uh, climate mitigation um, vehicles that are implemented on uh, public lands and across onto private lands as well. Um, and then I, I run this program of the um, California Forest Lighter Analytics um, Collaborative, which um, is uh, basically just trying to build capacity amongst the implementation partners for climate adaptation planning. Um, so the you know in california we're really clear climate emergency is upon us um we have had uh climate stressors um that have been producing extreme wildfire behavior since at least 2012 and um you know most of this century has been um you know we we've been seeing um, um trends of declining forest health um some of these effects are are not climate alone they're also um the um the aftermath of historical uh natural resource management and in particular um there's two factors where the um, um the the post uh harvest landscape in the in the post-world war ii period um much of california's commercial forests were liquidated and um there's been a, a um, a challenge in managing um, both private and public lands. And then e um, equally um, important is that there's been a, um, the suppression of wildfire has caused uh, our, our forest to uh, lack, um, basically wildfire suppression has, has exacerbated the wildfire problems that we're facing now. Um, so California is also, uh, initiated a, a comprehensive uh, forest climate policy um, and has provided uh, significant resources to uh, implementation partners to um, do something about the, the landscape challenges we face. Um, in 2018, uh, during the last administration, the Brown administration, there was a California forest carbon plan. And um, I think this is an interesting um, model that has that could have parallels for uh, implementers of of red plus programs across the world um, we you know there are specifics to our circumstances in uh, Mediterranean climate that is drying due to climate change um, but um, as we look at uh, climate disruption across the world um, you know we are going to have to adapt force management appropriately. Um, now, one of the things that my uh, shared stewardship program really works with is, um, you know, the fact that the the organizations that are going to implement um, our climate solutions don't necessarily look like traditional natural resource agencies. Um, 
you know, and, and a significant part of that is um, based on human resources issues. Um, you know, our, um, um, the uh, traditional model of agency driven um, natural resource planning is not what is leading climate resilience adaptation at this point um, here. And so with that, um, one of the things that we're seeing a significant break up in is all of the traditional natural resource agencies have established enterprise geospatial resources. And um, this transition to these, these new entities is really an opportunity to use, um, you know, significantly different geospatial infrastructure. Um, one of my colleagues has uh, uh, wrote this uh, in, um, uh, assessment of uh, capacity needs for these uh, non-traditional uh, force resilience implementers. Um, and, you know, we're looking at somewhere in the range of uh, 250 um, organizations in the state that are applying um, uh, or, or intend to apply climate resilience strategies uh, for forest landscapes. Um, now, so the California Forest Lighter Analytics Collaborative was funded through a, uh, an award by the Bay Area Council's 2020 California Resilience Challenge. Um, and what we were realizing is that uh, in the commercial forestry sector, um, LIDAR is an obvious uh, um, tool to, to do uh, landscape-wide planning. Um, but in, in these public planning efforts, it really, you know, we weren't, um, we were seeing a lot of challenges in applying it on the agency side. They don't necessarily have the human resources to adopt the technology. Um, and then in these, um, these, uh, third party implementers, um, you know, they're often, uh, very, uh, uh, they have limited budgets, they have limited resource budgets, um, and they're they're basically building teams to complete individual projects. Um, so where we kind of went got to is the um, you know we want to empower the communities that are um, putting change on the, on the ground. We want to give them the best uh, tools possible. Um, and frankly, there's uh, the open source uh, geospatial uh, toolboxes are essentially the best aligned tools available. Um, now, one of the important principles for us is the uh, co-production of data with our partners. Um, and I think that um, one of the drivers of the enterprise geospatial vision has been um, looking at this as essentially a command economy where you, allo you concentrate the information resources into an agency that dispenses um, resources to do the, the, the job. And where we've really looked at is how do we build the capacity from the ground up? And really we want to make it the, the foresters who are um, putting in prescriptions on the small levels or even small private landowners who are um, potentially planning uh, forestry interventions on allotments as, as small as a hectare, um, you know, they can, they can um, receive uh, real value from using uh, point cloud data. So um, in the United States, there's a federal program, uh, 3DEP, which uh, is currently has something like 31 trillion points. It's a it's a phenomenal um, public program. Um, it it requires uh, identifying funders to um, to match the the federal investment. And California has had a real challenge um, organizing um, the funding for this. At currently, 80 percent of the United States is covered in the three debt program, um, and California is significantly is significantly behind. Um, one interesting topic for internationally is that there are several efforts to um, develop lighter programs globally. And um, I've had interactions with Earth Archive who are uh, planning um, extensive work in South America and um, they're likely to use uh, similar approaches as, um, as for uh, 
hosting their data sets. Um, now, in 2020, as I was developing this proposal, the governor had proposed this, you know, completing um, California Lighter Acquisition. Um, the legislature rejected it both because it came about at the beginning of COVID, but also they had a really uh, significant critique of um, uh, not having established a, um, um, a essentially a data management plan in, in a, um, a a data life cycle analysis. And this has turned into somewhat of a um, a uh, touchstone for me because, um, you know, essentially what we want to do is we want to validate the public investments um, by by using it and we want to improve the performance of all of our partners by, um, you know, giving them the best available uh, technology and improve their forestry outcomes. Um, so why LIDAR? I mean, LIDAR uh, is unique in it's generally tasked uh, with the exception of JEDI, which is the space station based LIDAR. But um, I mostly concentrate on, on airborne LIDAR that um, in the United States, the economy of scale is uh, approximately 1500 km square kilometers at a time is the optimal collection size. Um, the um, basically it, it provides a snapshot of forest canopy structure at a given time. Um, and many of our, uh, many of our uh, climate resilience strategies are really gonna be based on structure. And um, um, we also need, um, you know, systematic review and quality control for public programs. And we also need to create, um, you know, a um, transparent environmental compliance pathways so that, um, are um, that so that the you know the public both has uh, confidence in the expenditures for these climate resilience plans, but then also um, that we're we're engaging with critics and we're um, we're building the best possible um, plans. And we think that um, having a um, the the lidar facilitates a kind of landscape numeracy that is unique. Um, and especially with um, our specific challenges here are not so much um, the, the conversion of forest to other land uses, although that is an issue, but um, basically the, uh, the suppression of wildfire over the last um, 100 years or so has created, um, uh, has basically encouraged more dangerous forest conditions. And so structural modifications of the forest are our are, are pathway towards resilience and one of the best most effective ways to achieve that is with prescribed fire and but often we need to do mechanical thinning in advance in order to um, uh, implement prescribed fire in a safe manner um, so we have we have significant issues as barriers of adoption um, uh, similar to what rob uh, articulated in his his um, uh, initial talk, um, you know, the, these LiDAR data sets are really big uh, data sets. And um, the optimal strategy is, is to, do, you know, do the, the computational work in the cloud. Um, I identified with virtually everything uh, Rob said about still downloading data myself, even though um, I really encourage users to use cloud resources to the extent that's possible. Um, so we also have these issues with um, non-governmental organizations have uh, funding cycle issues that are limited or that are focused on implementation of specific uh, projects. And for us, one of the things is that we are working under um, basically a 10 year um, climate resilience plan. We really, in California, there's a lot of our uh, policy infrastructure is really focused on what we're going to get to by 2025 and then 2020, 2030. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the, the big data problems are fundamentally, um, you know, are we training enough people to engage uh, and are, are we, um, and so, you know, I see this really as, um, you know, we want to, um, Develop the capacity to use the cloud resources over a long time frame, um, and 
you know, hopefully there's also like a career, like um, kind of a positive feedback loop where we have, um, you know, engage with people to um, improve their work product at this point, and then they develop over, you know, time to meet the needs of society. Um, so we we follow a lot of complementary technologies um, that are phenomenal. Um, I think that the, there's um, remarkable maturity at this point in the um, spectral remote sensing side. Um, and then there's other, um, you know, the radar and, and like JEDI applications and to some degree the UAV applications are, are still emerging. Um, and I am absolutely interested in them, but for our uses, we've, we've felt that um, because so many of our use cases are, are fundamentally about three-dimensional structural modification, that was where we uh, were focusing for this program. But, uh, you know, um, I could, I follow all of these topics. Um, um, so our goal is to accelerate ad adoption of, uh, of the technology in a manner that is improving the outcomes. And so, you know, these are the strategies that we, we came up with is hosted resources, sharing our tools, um, and really trying to train best practices. Um, and, you know, with this, um, um, this model, I think that where we're, um, virtually any of our, um, technologies that we're trying to bridge from the um, kind of developer and the research community to like the applied science side, we really want to create um, kind of the, the social environment that supports the applications. Um, so why is FOSS such a big deal for this? Is one, um, you know, stable in, in uh, continuous progress. And one of the places that I really want to emphasize is to think about um, um, the um, non-economic forests that um, that are not uh, industrial forests. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have the kind of um, stable funding. And so the idea of users being able to maintain control of the, the data sets that they're using to plan their um, their forests is something that's really valuable. Um, and the other thing, transparency. You know, we we want the this um, natural resources are inherently political, and we want to have um, transparent process and um, uh, give uh, you know people access to the decision making process. And particularly, we want to make um, our decision processes clear to our successors. And that's particularly important in the um, climate mitigation adaptation space because you know we're looking at these with the the carbon markets, we're looking at this over you know 100 year time frames. Um, okay, so this this program was really inspired by a lot of um, um, a lot of programs that um, you know, this is this is certainly not. Uh, I feel like uh, it's explicitly not cutting edge. Um, open topography um, started, I think, at least 13 years ago. Um, basically, distributing um, NSF funded or National Science Foundation funded lidar, and basically building derivatives for people on in, um, in a manner that um, uh, really uh, facilitated the growth of. Uh, use of LIDAR in the earth sciences. And it was a um, critically important um, place where skills were built. Um, more recently, NEON, uh, the National Ecological Observatory Network, uh, has done a phenomenal job building um, uh, long-term remote sensing pipelines for their sites and their, um, you know, an amazing reference implementation of, of, uh, of an open science project that's designed to last decades. Um, we partner with Cyverse uh, on um, high performance computing access and they've been phenomenal. They've, uh, with, uh, they have regular trainings and Carpentries and Jupiter um, are providing um, really important um, 
facilitation of open science as well. And o OSGO, of course, um, for, you know, personally speaking, uh, the OSGO has hosted a tremendous amount of learning as we are all at an OSGO event now. Um, now, so the tool stack that we're using for, um, for our applications, this, these are most of what we, you know, the LIDAR and in the R of, um, environment has been really useful. Much of our, our raster work ends up being done on grass. We use FVS, which is a forest service. Uh, the US Forest Service develops the software and it's, uh, um, we have um, kind of policy reasons to use FVS uh, for modeling uh, carbon. Um, uh, Pete All, Howard Butler's team's um, products are phenomenal and Jupiter. Um, so what we've kind of identified as our user needs is um, there's data plumbing issues, which, um, um, you know, really uh, limit a lot of users. Um, so, you know, just basically going through where you can get data and what you can do with it and, you know, um, is really important. And then um, basically just uh, developing reference implementations and, um, you know, helping users to, um, you know, uh, 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 implement uh, best practices is, is um, really important. And then, um, you know, policy representation has actually turned out to be a major role because um, as I've mentioned, um, we've had a difficulty organizing funding for um, large scale data sets and um, that uh, we're engaged in that right now. It's developing uh, proposals for um, wide area LIDAR acquisitions. Um, so we have a um, very specific user, uh, like a business case because we're working within this um, uh, climate resilience space where we have um, uh, specific demands on developing carbon budgets for forestry projects uh, because you know they're they're tied to climate mitigation funding. So generally speaking, we're trying to plan climate adaptation in parallel to climate mitigation. Um, and in most cases, um, you know we find climate adaptation is also acts as, as uh, adaptation and mitigation tend to go together. Um, okay, so we what we've we've done is we've had uh, we've basically developed uh, uh, relationships with uh, NGOs, local districts, uh, other uh, implementation partners, and really engage them on um, what their issues are, um, and then help them to um, develop products that they need. So this is like a most basic, this was done in grass. This is, um, um, uh, basically the, the simplest applications that capture forest canopy issues is, um, canopy height models, um, you know, topographic analysis, and then segmentation to individual tree. Um, and so this is, this is kind of a start um, down the road, but where we really want to emphasize uh, the techniques are, you know, more fuller um, point cloud utilization. Um, but this is basically within the reach of a lot of our users um, fairly quickly. Um, so this is another project. This is an example um, where um, we were uh, basically brought this. This is a regional prioritization from the um, from the transportation agency. Um, for um, a high, you know, how do how do we develop fire resilience around a highway? Um, and this is an iconic highway. The Highway One in California has, has um, significant um, like landscape architecture values. And um, in this case, uh, um, Caltrans has this a regional prioritization, and then um, this organization, the Roadwood Forest Foundation, which is a um, a nonprofit that essentially acquired a um, a uh, bankrupt timber company about 
15 years ago um, and is, is doing a variety of restoration work on it. They developed a proposal for a, um, a fuels project, a shaded fuel break on a ridge top that um, would improve the um, fire resilience of the, the region. So we started with this cartoon of where Caltrans has identified, this is their, their, their basic concept for how we achieve um, fire resilience around highway. And then the, we were given this, um, this vector coverage of proposed treatments. And then, um, you know, basically we took the, the uh, LIDAR and, and um, went to single, you know, um, normalized point cloud, single tree segmentation, and then, um, you know, basically did distributions of what trees were in each of these, um, these units. And then, you know, with the LIDAR, we can also identify the um, ease of access. So with this process, we significantly lowered the risk. Is it getting close so, uh, to Yeah, two minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have a lot of different use cases, uh, power lines, uh, a lot of ignitions with power lines, um, same processes. Um, so we've been working with uh, small private landowners who are um, basically don't have, uh, don't make income from their forests and um, want to engage in forest improvement projects. Um, and these are, um, they're, these are really important um, users. Um, so we've, this is not necessarily a very good example of sustainable forestry, but this is a hydrologic experiment where this is the maximum legal harvest in a hydrologic experiment in California. But this is what we're advocating for post-treatment surveillance is you know UAV-based acquisitions. Um, we do a lot of work with geomorphic grade line assessments, which are um, repairing restoration work um, where, um, and this was done in grass. Um, we work in oak woodlands. Uh, this conifer encroachment issue is a major climate hazard. Um, um, identifying le legacy forest elements is a, a huge use of the LIDAR data sets. Um, this is one of our standard uh, approaches where, um, you know, removing uh, ladder fuels and, um, you know, reducing the density, the stand density is really important. Um, we have a huge issue with post-fire treatments. Um, so this is a standard product. The DNBR is the, the normalized burn ratio, and this is a soil burn severity map made out of this. And, you know, basically we do um, we use LIDAR to do, um, you know, geotechnical work in the post-fire environment, um, assess pre-fire canopy and change, um, general geotechnical uh, material. So um, in summary, um, you know, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and uh, reuse, um, uh, fair data practices are, are you know, critical. Uh, we think that providing a venue for um, long-term data management is is really important. Um, and uh, I will haunt the uh, the uh, the map at lunch if anyone wants to, to reach me. And uh, I wanted to acknowledge, uh, thanks Rob for hosting this and uh, my funders, Bay Area Council, Key, as well as our partners, Humboldt County uh, Resource Conservation District. And, um, you know, and also um, the folks I worked with this summer have been phenomenal. And, um, you know, all the developers that make this, uh, um, make this possible, frankly. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, we have uh, one question. Uh, yeah. You had to cover this, but how often do you fly airborne LIDAR surveys? I guess due to wildfire incidents in California, the canopy can change quickly, right? Yeah, that's a that's a real problem. Okay, so the standard for the what USGS will ostensibly co-fund is an eight-year return interval at a QL2, which is um, I think it's two points per square meter of of beam pulses. Um, what we're advocating for, but this is not a reality yet, is um, five-year um, QL1, and we have a proposal in right now. Knock on wood for uh, the first, uh, well, an early USGS reef survey 
of eight-year-old data. So in order to qualify for USGS co-funding, it's until they finish the whole country, they're, they're, uh, what they are after is eight-year return interval. Um, so, so many counties are now flying LIDAR on their own. Um, so it's... Very cool. uh,